annoy everybody with our gear. <laughs> hey, hey, everyone, it's Michelle B. Hashtag Soboka and welcome to the Real Estate Reinvention podcast, vlogcast, or as I like to say, whatever cast. I am super pumped today to have a fellow Gator on my show, the fantastic Sean Carpenter. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Michelle. S honored to be here and excited about our conversation we're going to have. I am too. Um, one of the things that uh, you have to know about Sean is he is one of the top coaches in the country. He is a wealth of information. Today, we're going to we're going to talk about building relationships and also how to create um, fantastic customer experiences. I've seen you speak on this live at the Florida Association of Realtors. Uh, probably when was that before COVID? So I think it was 2019, maybe. I believe so. And I'll be back again this year in August. So excited. Oh, to awesome. That's awesome. It's in Orlando. It's hot as you know what, but it's always a good, um, a good conference and for rebar. So they do a fantastic job with rebar and our friend Bill Risser always um, has a lot to do with that, and, you know, putting that all together. So um, the first thing, though, that we have to discuss is our gear here and how we actually met. Yeah. Um, so um, would you like to lead off or would you like me to lead off? Yeah, why don't you, well, you, it was kind of a, a I heard something in the corner. Uh, you know, I, I met you, I think, just, you know, a name introduction. Then you were on the phone, I believe, at the bar camp or at Florida Realtors. Yeah. We were talking to somebody and I thought, well, there's no way that that name doesn't know mean the same person that I'm thinking of back home. Right. So why don't you, why don't you set it up? So I was on the phone with my sister-in-law in Columbus, Ohio. My husband's entire family is from Columbus. Sean's from Columbus. They live in Upper Arlington. Sean, you're in Upper Arlington I mean, too, I'm, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I, I said, all right, well, thanks, Nat. I'll talk to you later. I think it was something like that. And you went, Annette Belisari, Nettie Belisari? Yeah. And I said, yeah. How do you know Nettie? I go, well, that's my sister-in-law. And you go, I went to high school with her. Yeah, she was a couple years behind me. Yeah, and it was just, it, it, you just don't know too many Netties, right? And uh, <laughs> that's so funny. And then obviously, Greg, her brother, uh, was a star at Ohio State for years and uh, was just, uh, just that, that name, Belisari, has a has a cachet for, for sure in Upper Arlington and around around Columbus. Yeah. And yet here we are in our gator gear. So that was the other like overlap. So yeah, my, you know, my dad taught at Ohio State for 29 years up until the day he died. But when it came time to choose a school, uh, luckily, my parents gave us kind of a option and a budget and said, you know, if you want to go to Harvard, you get the budget and you got to make it up in scholarships. And if you want to go to Ohio State, you can keep the difference because the dad's discount as a professor there. And I wanted a school like Ohio State, Michelle, but I wanted to be in the South. And so I fell in love with the University of Florida the second I stepped onto it. It's very similar to Ohio State as far as a big campus, lots of green space, huge sports program, big Greek system. And I, I, I fell in love with it and had the best six years of my life there. And I say six years. I'm not a doctor. I don't have a master's degree. I just wasn't in any hurry to get out of school because I had so much fun. So I'm going to ask you a question. What year did you actually graduate from the University of Florida? 1991. And I was uh, there, I graduated 86. Okay. So I was there from 85 through 91. There you go. Great. Good times, by the way. It was so, good times. You know, one of the things I think that's kind of cool, and I always say sports is such a great equalizer, right? And I look at real estate as really kind of like a sport. There's so many moving pieces on how to get to the end zone, right? How to get that first, second, third down. And one of the things I like about Sean is he really explains uh, certain concepts so easily. So I think the first thing that we should talk about is relationships yeah. and how important that is now, especially with what's gone on with, uh, you know, NAR and some other things. Um, let's talk a little bit about relationships in real estate. Well, it, it's that it's kind of the anchor of my, of my career, you know, 26 years in the real estate business. I go back to when I was a, a rookie agent, you know, a typical hungry rookie, just like a rookie on a team would. They watch the veterans, they watch the stars, they watch the leaders of the team, and they try and figure out what's the nuances, what's the ways I can get into the game. And I, I really sat back and I said, you know, there's three things a successful agent does, and it has and it, become my philosophy, you know, since back in that early days for 26 years. Real estate is really about three things to me. It's about building relationships. It's about solving problems. It's about having fun. 
If you can do those three things on a consistent basis, think about that. Building relationships, either a new relationship with someone you've never met or deepen a relationship with someone you've known for years. If you can help people solve their problems on a consistent basis, whether they're real estate related problems or not, if you help enough people solve problems, when they have a real estate problem, they're probably going to call the person who's good at solving problems. And if you can have fun doing it, that's just a pretty good pretty good day, right? So I know when you're new in the business, when you're experienced in the business, you're looking for buyers, you're looking for sellers, you're looking to earn referrals. But if you build relationships and solve problems and have fun, guess what you get? Buyers and sellers and referrals. And so um, relationships, I think, you know, I, I, I talk in my presentations, Michelle, competence just gets you in the game, right? Getting your license in, in Ohio is 120 hours. A lot of states around the, 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 the country, it's 60 hours, 90 hours, you know, 75 hours. But that just gets you in the game. That just gets you a seat at the table. It's the relationships that win the game, right? Because the houses, the condos, the the land, the apartments, you know, that's just the widget that we happen to use, right? It's about the people that live in the houses that you're earning that business from. And I think, you know, so it's, it's not really what you know, it's who you know. So there's two sets of realtors. There's, like you said, the newer realtors, right? And how do they go about building those relationships? So let's start with that. And then let's segue over into, say, a seasoned realtor and how they can deepen those relationships. A couple of tips for each of them. Yeah, well, let's let's talk, start with that, that when you're new in the business, instantly leveraging the ripple effect. And the ripple effect basically says this, if I know 100 people and they know 100 people, then I'm only, two, I'm only one contact away from 10,000 people, right? If those 100 people know 100 people, then I'm only two contacts away from a million people. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, would you rather know a lot about five people or nothing about the 500 behind them? See, the answer is, I want to know a lot about five people, right? So many people, when, they, when they're new in the business, they think, well, I already know these five people, so I got to go meet more people. Because in pre-licensing class, they told me I got to meet more people. But if I know these five people or these 10 people or these 20 people really well, Michelle, and I know their names and where they went to college and their spouses' names and their kids' names and their pets' names and their hobbies and their interests and their likes and dislikes, over time, they're going to turn around and tell their tribe, their people in their world, hey, if you guys need help with real estate, come to the front of the line. My friend Michelle Bellasari is going to take awesome care of you. My friend Sean Carpenter is going to take awesome care of you. And that's how you get to meet the people behind them is through the people that you know, right? If you think about our, our business like a like a like a dartboard, right? Like a, like a bullseye. So many people, they just say, I'll just build a bigger target. Cause then the bigger I build my target, no matter where I throw my dart, I hit somebody. And I don't get that because, so wait, you're going to build your, your target based on strangers and just keep adding strangers onto your target. In that approach, you have to push people into your business. But what if you were so good with the people in the middle of that target, your bullseye people, you were so good at taking care of them and delivering a memorable experience to those people that you actually attracted people into the middle of the target, right? The, 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 the idea should be if people are standing up looking over the edge of that target, right? Looking over the fence and saying like, how do I get what that guy's delivering in the middle? I want that. So keeping that target as a metaphor, the people on the outer ring, they might get your annual newsletter, right? The next ring in might get your in annual newsletter plus they're on your email newsletter campaign. Then the next ring in gets that plus they get your market updates. Then the next ring in gets that plus invites your quarterly happy hours. Then the next ring in gets that plus they get calls on birthdays and anniversaries. Then the next ring in that gets personal pot buys once a quarter and so on and so forth. So you spend your time, effort and money on the people in the middle because they're the ones that gave you your time, effort, money. And then you work your way out into the people that are the strangers on the outside. So once again, the ripple effect and then figure out who those layers of people are and what type of attention, care, uh, you know, how do you show up to those people? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where agents get overwhelmed because they're like, well, you need to do this and you need to do that. And you, you know, and, you know, like, for example, my market, most of the folks that I work with um, aren't really here because they are selling a property that is inherited or it's their parents that are downsizing and things like that. So they're outside the area. So doing say like a party isn't going to fly because they're not even here for that party. Right. So, you know, for like, uh, like for example, for states like Arizona, California, Florida, what do you think would be one cool thing that you could do for those out of state clients that you never really have that contact with again? Well, I, one of the, one of the most underutilized tools, I think that, that so many people, 
almost forget it's there is video texting. Right. And I think, you know, for someone like you, your personality and you got a lot of people, like you said, out of, out of the area a video text. Right. From a, a, from a, a bar, outdoor bar patio, from a from a pier, from a from a from a boat to some of your clients saying like, hey, Michelle, it's it's, you know, Sean Carpenter. I'm down in, in Boca. Beautiful weather. I just wanted to show you the new thing that's going in here on the intercoastal and you turn your camera around, maybe show them. Right. Once again, they that's that FOMO. They feel like they should be there. Right. So video texting is, is free. It's going to go right to people's screens, right? And then they can watch it. And in most cases, they're going to save that video or they're going to watch it again or they're going to share it with somebody and then they're going to respond to you. So I think video texting is just, once again, give people a chance to, you know, you know, it, as we said earlier, you know, okay. I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not an Ohio State fan. I'm an Ohio State follower, right? I'm a, yes. I grew up there watching them. So I go to Buckeye games when I'm there. If I sold a house to someone who I know is a big Buckeye fan and they've moved away, I'm the next ball game. I'm going to go to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sh show some videos from the tailgate. I'm going to, I'm going to Facebook. I'm going to, I'm going to FaceTime them from the tailgate. I'm going to video text them from the tailgate. Right. And, and let them feel like, Oh man, I wish I was there because all of a sudden now they're thinking of Columbus, their time here. Yeah. They used to work here. The people that, you know, that family still lives there that now all of a sudden when those people bring up real estate, maybe they think about me. Right, I so. love that idea. I love that idea. So make sure you guys are writing this down. Um, I think that's a fantastic idea. And you're right. It is underutilized. I do a lot of video. I never, ever video text anyone. Yeah. Ever. And it's so such a simple, way. it's it's a great way, Michelle, for people that that know they need to get involved in video. Yeah. Whether it's on Reels or TikTok or, or YouTube, but they're afraid to do it. Well, video texting is kind of a more of a one-to-one. -one, and so yeah. it's easier just to kind of hit that button, hit record and send I it. Love that. Um, I love you know, that. Another thing you can do that, that's probably easily identifiable in your marketplace or in a out of area marketplace is, you know, you've probably got a uh, South Florida magazine or a Boca magazine, or like we get one in here in our neighborhood in, in, in West Chase. That's, you know, it's called Wow, West Chase News or something like that. But once you've read it, could you get a couple of your neighbors copies and send it to your people that are out of the area and just give them a little taste and they can flip through and see the ads for the restaurants they used to go to. And, you know, so little things like that with a post-it note on the front, just a little post-it note that says thought about you, right. Or that, that little, you know, that little meaningful touch I used to call them, or I still call them as those meaningful touches that have nothing to do with real estate, but makes people know that you were thinking about them. You know, it's a good point because there's a financial planner here locally who I've known for years and every couple of months he will send me a great email about the market that not the financial markets, the real estate market. And it usually is, I thought you might find this of interest or something like that. And he's such a nice guy. So, I mean, he's very well thought of, he's a brilliant guy, but just the fact that I get that, I always think of him, I'm like, that is so cool that he does that. I'm not going to be able like to do business with him per se um, on that side, but the fact that I get that, you're absolutely right. So I think that's a great point. What about for seasoned agents? Because I think seasoned agents get bored with what they're doing. And then they're like, well, you know, I'm just going to, you know, click. Okay. You know, click. <laughs> yeah. Well, once again, it, 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 they've, they've taken the time and they've worked their, their careers off to build that relationship with those people that hopefully become repeat and referral business. You know, things like our friend Anthony does, right? The weekend bucket list for Tampa. He, you know, he and his team curate things that are going on, whether it's festivals, farmers markets, concerts, you know, and then they just put it, you know, and there's sources out there, guys, called the internet where you can gather this information, put it into a nice little, you know, templated piece. And then, you know, using AI almost, you can create a, a template to set it and forget it and then just send that out. It's those reminders. Um, it's the it's the invites to events, right? And I think you should invite the people who are out of area the same way you invite the people who are in area. I mean, yeah. Look, you you know if you're going to invite 100 people and 80 of the people that you invited aren't don't live in in your town, probably a lot of them aren't going to respond. But if they're in town, visiting family, or they're coming in to stay at their condo that weekend, or they happen to be in town, they might show up. But more importantly, they it's just a reminder that you're their person in insert city, right? And so those those touches, and I, I just think, you know, I, I said it on another podcast I was on, but. You know, one of my sayings, Michelle, is your LTM could be your ATM, right? Your LTM could be your ATM. What that means is your last 12 months could be a fountain of money if you stayed in touch with the people you sold in the last 12 months. But so often in our business, we work hard to get our clients to the closing table. But as soon as we close, we move on to the next client to get yeah, them to buy. Right. And while we don't want to forget those people and we try not to with 
with our follow-up campaigns and our and our keeping touches, those are the people that are still thinking about real estate. Your buyers that bought last month are still unpacking boxes. They're still learning their way to work. They're still learning what channel is NBC in their new town and what channel mm -hmm. is CBS in their new town. They're still learning this pizza shop or this pizza shop, right? This coffee shop or this coffee shop. So they're still thinking about the market. We should be in touch with those people as part of our customer service, our customer experience, you know, the day after closing, two yeah. days after closing, one week after closing, one month after closing, and then on a consistent basis thereafter. A lot of agents, let's be honest, Michelle, a lot of agents don't follow up with clients, especially on the buy side, because they're thinking, what if there's something wrong? Uh, totally. We, we should say to ourselves, what if there's something wrong? I get a chance to show them that I'm not just going to cash a commission check and be gone. Right. I'm here to help them as their advisor, right? As their consultant, as their, as their guide. And just because we got them to the destination doesn't mean our relationship ends there. Because think, I, I think about this a lot. In order to get referral business from your past clients, you have to be repeat worthy. Meaning if I sell you a house and I do a good job and you're willing to repeat business with me, then you'd probably be willing to refer me. But if you're not willing to repeat business with me, if you say, you know, Sean was okay, but I would never do business with him again. You're certainly not going to refer me because the first referral has to be yourself. And we call that a repeat business, right? Mm -hmm. If you're willing to refer your own business to you, to me, you'd probably be willing to refer others to you. So sometimes we think, well, my clients are all going to come back to me. Well, if they're not going to come back to you, they're not going to refer you either. So you got to earn that repeat business before you can earn that referral business. I, I love that. And um, I, and I think that this is, this is such an important conversation because, you know, Malcolm Lawson brought up something the other day and he said, you know, this is the time where you actually probably have time to do content. Mm -hmm. So do content and to make sure that you're staying in touch with your sphere of influence, your client base, um, try not to use the words, my past clients, they're clients for life. Right. 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 So yeah, I we, you know, we, we, we call them past clients in our colloquial real estate language. I know, yeah. We should think of them as clients. If I went to your dentist right now, Michelle, let's say your dentist is Dr. Smith, right? If I went to Dr. Smith and said, Hey, Dr. Smith, I'm just doing some, some customer research. Who's Michelle Belisari? Dr. Smith would say, she's one of my patients. Why do you ask? Dr. Smith wouldn't say she's a past patient of mine. She came in two months ago for a cleaning. She'd say she's one of my patients. Yeah. And so we should think of all of our clients as clients that will do business with us in the future, even if they've moved away, right? If I sell someone a house in Columbus, Ohio, and they move to Texas, people say, well, they're not going to, they're not coming back. Why should I stay in touch with them? Well, wait a second. They lived here for 44 years of their life. They right. worked here for the last 12. They went to school here. They have four family members that live down the street. They have a high school classmates in the hundreds, right? They could move back. Their job might fall apart. They might get divorced, whatever it might be. Of course, I want to stay in touch with them. I might stay in touch with them on a less frequency basis. They might get four touches a year instead of 16 touches a year. But, and they're getting different touches too, right? Because it's, you know, relevance isn't one size fits all. Right. So they might get different touches. So, you know, I, I think you make a good point is that, you know, I want to, I want to call them clients, not past clients. Right. And I, I think I think we've gotten into the habit of that. So I agree with you 100 percent. So let's talk a little bit about customer experiences, okay? because that I, I remember you talking about that as well. And, um, and by the way, I want to give a shout out to Anthony, because when I saw him at Florida Association of Realtors at um, Rebar Camp, he was the one who literally, I never forgot this. I walked up to him. I said, talk to me about that newsletter because I'd already had, you know, Soboka for about a year or so. And I said, I need to send something out. And it was his inspiration that led me to doing uh, a, a fairly, you know, uh, weekly email. And to the, to the point that if you go to soboka.com, I have a weekend tab that is all evergreen. So when I send out my email, because it was just getting to be a little overwhelming, um, it's somewhat set up other than like plug and play a few things. But the main link is in the email for all things weekend. And it, it connects to a ton of links, you know. But uh, he's the one who encouraged me. And he spoke about it at Rebar that time. Yeah. So, so let's talk about customer experiences. 
Okay. Well, listen, I think that that's one of the maybe first places is let's define that because I think sometimes we think great service is customer experience. Great service is part of customer experience, but it's not by itself enough, right? Think about the word great service. A lot of agents say, if I can just deliver great service, I'll be good. Well, great service in 2024, Michelle, is expected, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, think about this. As you as a consumer, if you don't get great service, what do you do? You go somewhere else. You go you somewhere take your business else. Elsewhere, right? Think about our 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 human our, our human instinct when we Google something. If we don't find what we're looking for on page one, most of us retype in what we're looking for. We don't go to page two, right? Because we want immediate gratification. So great service is expected. A memorable experience, though, is something that happens before, during, and after the transaction, right? An experience that that goes from start to finish. And along the way, there's lots of little great service moments. But in in real estate, if you really think about it, Michelle, we don't control a lot of the transaction. We control our actions. We control a little bit of our clients' actions or reactions. We we hopefully have a good relationship with a co-op agent, but we don't control that. We don't control the other client. We don't control the lender, the appraiser, the underwriter, the home inspector. We don't control those things. So how can we create this experience that that throughout these checkpoints, we're making sure our clients feel comfortable. We're asking lots of questions. We have maybe some check-in pro- check-ins along the way, systems in place. So we know when this happens, this happens. Because at the end of the day, when someone says, we just sold our house, it was a great experience. Right. It's more than just my client did his job or my client right. did his job, right? Great yeah. services, you know, it's the little things and great service is important. Don't get me wrong. But if anywhere along the way, no matter how great your service was, if the clients had a negative experience because the inspection, the underwriter, the buyer backed out of the deal over a BS reason, whatever, those people aren't going to say, you know, it sucks that the buyer backed out, but our our agent gave really good service. They're going to say the deal fell apart. They're going to only talk about the negative, right? Right. You know, Douglas, I think it's Douglas Kahneman is a, social psychologist, he talks about the peak end experience. Mm. And he talks about people remember the highest or lowest point of the experience, and they remember how it ended, the peak end experience. And so if you have a great thing, you know, your buyer wins a multiple offer transaction, right? They, They beat 13 other offers out. That's the peak. We got it. And then how does the deal end? Those are the two things they're going to remember. So once you get that peak, then you say, all right, we got the peak done. Now we got to make sure it ends well. We got to get to the finish line because those are the two points of things people remember. If something negative happens, a waiter spills soup on you. That was the peak. That was the that was the thing they remember. How was it? How was it resolved? Right. Did you come out and apologize? Did you offer to pay their tab? And did you offer to pay their cleaning? Right. And give them a coupon to right. come back another time. Right. That's going to end well. Versus we're sorry, but the waiter slipped on some a wet floor. Right. That's not going to end well. So yeah. they're going to remember the peak, and they're going to remember how it ended. So. When it comes to collecting Google reviews, for example, right, you're hoping that the experience of the client was exceptional and they will be willing to give you that five star review. When do you feel is a good time to start planting a seed for that? Um, well, hopefully maybe at the beginning of the conversation, right? Mm-hmm. The listing appointment or the buyer counseling session. Hey, if we do a good job for you, Mr. And Mrs. Client, you know, we would really love to earn a great review from you. As you know, in today's marketplace, reviews are very important. A lot of people pay attention to reviews, whether it's on Yelp or TripAdvisor or Google. Um, people do sometimes do a little preliminary research to find out who they're, they're going to be working with. So can I ask you a question, Mr. And Mrs. Client? If I do a good job, would you feel comfortable providing me with that review? Right. Um, and, you know, I, I just had some service done here at my house this weekend, this past weekend. And literally, I think within an hour of the serviceman driving away, I got a quick little text message response saying, how did we do? And it was just a choice of, of clicking the number of stars. Right. So I just reactively clicked five stars. Yep. And then two days later, they said, thank you for your review. Would you mind doing a more detailed review for us? Nice best indication of future behavior is past behavior. Because I clicked the five stars, there's maybe a good chance I'm going to fill out the actual writing the review. Now, I'll admit, you probably do this as well, because we know how important reviews are. We probably give a little more reviews than the average person because yeah. it's almost that karma. If, if I give enough reviews, I'll get some reviews back. Yeah. And so I wrote a nice review. And it also, think about this. When I wrote that nice review, because I was logged in as Google, it's going to show my username and my name, and people can click on that to see what service I provide. 
Yep. Right? So um, I think asking for it up ahead, then at the closing table or right before the closing, asking once again, if it, if we had a peak, right? We got that deal in contract. Gosh, Mr. Ms. Buyer, I'm so excited. We beat 13 other offers out. You guys came in so strong and I'm so happy. I had a great relationship with the co-op agent. We were able to get some inside information. By the way, your lender really had something to do with that as well because he has a great brand name in this town or he has a great reputation. Once again, reinforcing their choices and say, I, I hope when everything gets to the finish line, you can write me a really awesome review to let people know yeah. how hard I work for you. Things like that, right? I think that's super important right now. We have a lot of conversations about Google reviews and getting to a certain number, not um, doing review for review, like agent agent reviews, being very careful about how you're doing that. Um, rate my agent is something that I use um, frequently. Uh, it's easy to use uh, to get those reviews. And I do start planting the seeds, especially after a certain time in the transaction uh, so that it's not a big like, oh, you know, can you do this? You know, I'll always kind of say something to that fact that, you know, hey, when we're, you know, closed and and moving on to, you know, the next chapter, may I send you a link to do a five star Google review? Like I'm very yeah. clear on the five star. And listen, when someone says something to you, maybe at the closing table, you're walking into the closing, right? And they say, Michelle, you've been such a help. We we so appreciate it. We could never have done this without you. you. Say, you know, you've been such a blast to work with as well. Would you guys mind putting those words in writing? Would yeah. you mind just as simple as what you just said? Or when you get that text after the closing, right? We just moved in, the house is immaculate. We love it. We can't wait to have you over say, hey, this text would be a great review. Would you mind copying and pasting this to the link below, right? I love it. Make it easy for people. It. They've already said the words. You just got to show them they, they need to put just it somewhere. Just in writing. Tap, 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 the tapping cat. So, Sean, you travel all over the country speaking. You've got a, a real finger on the pulse. Yeah. What right now, before we close, what do you feel the biggest struggle agents are having and then the second part of the question is, what do you think um, agents are having the most success with right now in 2024? Okay. Biggest struggle is they're listening to too many voices, right? We, we all like to say, I don't care what other people think about me. Then why are you worrying about what other people are saying and doing, right? I mean, we know we know the media is getting the story wrong. The headlines aren't correct, right? We, we can only tell our story, right? We... We, we talk to people and they, we have 5,000 friends on Facebook and we worry about offending 10 instead of taking care of the 2,000 that love us, right? right? And so listening to too many voices, I think is important. Look, we've got a long way to go between now and July or whenever this thing gets settled. There's so many moving parts. It might be, it might be that, that time might be extended, right? The, the courts and the DOJ might say, look, Everyone seems to be doing their job and trying to get things in place. So we're going to set September 1st as the new deadline to have these forms in place or these things in place. So many questions right now. And I yeah. think with the questions without answers give frustration, right? Questions without solid, consistent answers. And guess what? The solid, consistent answer is different for you and your broker than it is for me and my broker. We're in different markets. We're in different companies. We're in different, uh, we're in different jurisdictions. So going on a Facebook group, and asking a question of someone in Galveston, Texas, and you're an agent in Seattle, Washington, it's not going to help you, right? No. So too many, too much listening. The the on the positive side, sit, build relationships, solve problems, and have fun. Work with the people that are in your audience. Work with your tribe. Work with, as Anthony said, your small viable audience, and say how can I help them? Because as of today that we're recording this, nothing has changed, right? Nothing right. has changed. We can still help buyers. We can still help sellers. We can still advertise our commissions on our MLS system. We can still represent, but you know, we can still use the buyer representation form or not use a buyer representation form, depending on once again, your, your local rules and jurisdictions. Yep. But the fact is, is that today someone out there right now is going to buy a property. And today someone out there right now is going to list their property. And today someone is being transferred and today someone is getting divorced and today someone has a baby and today someone's getting a new yep. job. And today someone is getting, uh, a, getting getting losing a job and today someone's dying and so someone's going to need a real estate help and and i think the professionals the ones who have their finger on the pulse of the market the ones who are showing up right and trying their best and have a good attitude and respect the business they'll be the stars in the business i love it where can everybody find you and where are you going to be speaking uh, in the next few months so people can see you live. Yeah. So I am uh, easily found on, on social channels. Sean Carp uh, is, is my handles on Instagram and Twitter. I'm on usually Twitter first to start the day and end the day. It's my favorite channel. 
Uh, they can find me on Facebook as well. But Michelle, I'd love it if they would go to my, my blog, carpscorner.net. Carpscorner.net. I blog. My next blog post, Michelle, that I put out will be, I think, my 1240th blog post. I've been blogging since the year 2000. I blog every Monday morning. It's going to go in okay. your email inbox. So you can uh, go there and, and subscribe. And uh, uh, Did I get that right? right? Carpscorner.net. That's it. Carpscorner.net. And they, it's going to be I love it. fun stories about building relationships and solving problems and having fun and customer, customer experiences and great service and lots of fun things. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Go Gators. Hopefully we'll have a better season this year. Go Buckeyes because, you know, it is what it is. It is what it but, is. Yep. <laughs> and uh, thanks again, guys, for joining the Real Estate Reinvention podcast. And uh, stay tuned because every week we have another fabulous guest. And, um, you know, come back and share this with your friends. See you soon. Thanks.